Well, thank you much for that kind introduction. Thank you all for your perseverance and uh, hardiness. I sort of greet you as fellow members of the League of the Iron Butt at this point. Um, um, I'm impressed that y'all stuck it out. Um, it's really good to, um, to be here at any event associated with the memory of Wall Stegner. Um, one of my heroes and, um, uh, you know, I'll talk more tonight at the library about the kind of literary heritage of this place so strong and I can't be in Utah without thinking about not only Stegner but about Ed Abbey and about Terry Tempest Williams and about other dear friends of mine. Um, this is one of those places that uh, sinks deep in the national imagination um, and whose progress will be important in helping us rewrite the story of what it means to be an American. Now, you all been hearing from one expert after another. And um, um, you may be thinking, what use in hearing from a writer at this late date? And you may well be right. There may be not much use in it at all. But I must say, uh, in my defense, that I'm, um, I'm more of a technologist than you would imagine. Um, I've invented really a new technology that I'm going to be working with here today very energy efficient, um, very low carbon. I call it virtual PowerPoint. Um, um, now, if it works correctly, the pictures will appear in your mind as I speak. But, but the fact that we're not using sort of carbon-based energy to do it is going to require a certain amount of mental energy on your part, OK, just in a few places. But it's going to have, we have to have a little bit of a collaboration to really let some of this sink in. Now, we've heard an awful lot about climate change in the last day and a half. And I'm only going to provide the littlest bit of a summary here to kind of try to bring us to where I think we are now. And I'm going to do it just by recounting, since I'm one of the relative few who've gotten to watch the whole history of this thing, and it's only a 20-year history, you know, it's really only 20 years ago that climate change broke out into the national conversation. Um, I, I'm just going to provide a quick history of that to take us, I think, to where we need to be now. The first early period, around 1989, when I wrote the first book about all this, um, was the period of hypothesis. Now, we knew that there was the real chance that there was a problem. We knew enough about the molecular structure of carbon dioxide to uh, fear that we would begin to heat the planet with the amounts that we were pouring into the atmosphere. But what seemed scientifically sound also seemed emotionally counterintuitive. The idea that one species had grown large enough to dramatically alter the climate seemed at some level so unlikely. Um, um, this biggest of all forces around us. And so we went to work scientifically to try to establish whether or not that hypothesis worked. And that period of five or six years in the early 1990s was a period of great scientific achievement. Um, the, in, in the history of science, this group, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, thank you, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will be regarded as one of the great triumphs in the history of science for bringing together all that brain power from around the world in order to reach a workable consensus on a really difficult problem. We were able to reach a consensus by about 1995. That's when the IPCC said, yes, indeed, our actions are warming the climate and it's going to be a serious problem. It was a kind of coming of age moment for us as a species. That period, though, our understanding of exactly how all this was going to play out was pretty crude still. The computer modeling wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. The vast amounts of research hadn't yet been done. There's a number associated with that period, OK? 550, as in parts per million carbon dioxide. Store it a little bit in your mind for a moment. You don't have to store it permanently, because we're going to erase it and put a different number in in a minute. But before the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere was 275 parts per million. 
That's the world that civilization grew up in. That's the world that we understand. For all intents and purposes, that's the kind of baseline Earth, okay? In that first period, we had only a kind of first order approximation of what was going to represent danger. And so the number that people sort of chose, almost because it was easy to model in those computers, was 550 parts per million, a doubling of that pre-industrial revolution concentrations, okay? And it was chosen, as I say, almost as a matter of scientific convenience, but as such things happen, it became a kind of marker of its own. And the place where the early policy considerations were sort of aimed, what would we need to do to slow down our production of carbon dioxide to stay under this level, okay? The second period, or the period from roughly 1995 to roughly 2005, that decade, was the period of proof. All this science, it was as if the planet itself was conducting an extensive peer review to make sure that it was correct. We had the 10 warm, 10 of the warmest years on record in that decade, okay? And what we came to understand was that the planet was more finely balanced than we had suspected. That the change that we've already put into effect, thank you very much, the change that we'd already put into effect, that few parts um, um, per million, that one degree rise in temperature Fahrenheit that we've already caused from 59 degrees to 60 degrees, that that was enough to really unsettle the physical workings of the planet, okay? And that's what we've seen for the last decade. We've seen big changes in hydrology. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold air, so we get more evaporation and hence more drought in arid areas. We get, once that water's up there, it's gonna come down, so we get more deluge and flood in wet areas, lots more. Where I live, we've seen a 25% increase in the number of storms that dropped two inches of rain in a 24-hour period. We've seen massive flooding all around the world on scales that we haven't seen before, and for which the only explanation is this human perturbation of the climate. We've seen dramatic and easily now to predict spreads of all kinds of, of, uh, 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 of flora and fauna, particularly and probably most notably that one creature that most loves the warmer and wetter world that we're creating, the mosquito whose range has expanded across the tropics and the subtropics into all kinds of places where people had built cities over the millennia precisely because they were beyond the overwintering range of the mosquito that carried malaria. They no longer are, and now malaria, and on its tail, uh, dengue fever, even more devastating, spreading with relentless um, 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 ferocity across these areas. The Economist ran a story not long ago about dengue, talking about how the numbers, the per numbers of cases were up 100, 200, 300 percent across Latin America and much of Asia in the last few years, directly because of climate change. The last time I was in Bangladesh, I had the kind of poetic justice to come down with dengue in the first big outbreak that they'd ever had there. Um, um, and I was as sick as I'd ever been, but I was healthy going in, you know. Lots of people in Bangladesh aren't, and lots of them were dying while I was there, and they have absolutely nothing to do with that scourge now affecting their lives. When you try to measure how much carbon dioxide Bangladesh emits into the atmosphere, you can't really do it. It's, in a, for all intents and purposes, a rounding error in the international charts, okay? They're not causing the spread of dengue. We are, you know, the ways that we live. Seasonality changing quickly. At these latitudes, winter is weeks shorter on average measured by frost dates than it was just 30 years ago. On and on and on and on. There's a number associated with this period from 1995 to 2005 or so. And that number is about 450, 450 parts per million, okay? That's the number that first some environmental groups and then some of the more enlightened governments in the world, particularly uh, in the European Union, hit on as what the target we would need to maybe slow down uh, uh, this climate change and keep us uh, from going completely um, 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 into catastrophe. And that was considered a great stretch, and it still is considered a great stretch. We're not on a path to get anywhere near there at the moment, okay? 
That 450 parts per million is what's reflected in so many of the graphs and charts that we've seen from the IPCC, uh, say, over the course of these couple of days. In the last year and a half, we've entered into a third period, and that period is the period of fear. What we're coming to understand, what the science is telling us with almost weekly updates, if you read Science and Nature and the other periodicals, is that that both the magnitude and the pace of this change is coming at us much faster than we could have realized. Much faster. Scientists who I've talked to and interviewed for 25 years now have gone from having a kind of note of concern or a you know, note of, uh, of conviction in their voice when they talk about this to having a note of something approaching panic as we look at what is happening in the world in the last 18 months or so. It is very clear that we have underestimated the rate of the planet's response to the extra heat that we're pouring into this Earth. And probably the most obvious and powerful example of that came last fall with the melt, the rapid melt, the almost unbelievably rapid melt of Arctic ice. You'll recall the slide that Chuck showed earlier today about how the, the rate of melt was way, way, way faster than even the most pessimistic predictions of even a few years ago, even two years ago. Those predictions are now completely off the books. And as he said, there are people talking about the complete disappearance of summer sea ice in the Arctic by 2030. Terry Root, in her excellent presentation yesterday, you'll recall, was going through what would happen at the various steps if we increase the temperature one degree C or two degrees C or three degrees C. She said the IPCC predicts here at three degrees C that we'll begin to see big melt in Arctic sea ice. But actually, this is happening, she said, at one degree C, way faster than we had anticipated. And that, and all the other effects that we can measure in dozens of other systems, raises the stakes considerably. Okay? We're no longer talking, as Chuck talked about earlier this morning, about sea level rise measured in inches or feet in the course of this century, which had been pretty much the consensus prediction until a few years ago. We're now talking quite possibly as those great ice sheets above Greenland and the West Antarctic begin to cave at a very remarkable rate. We're now talking about, unless we get our act together very quickly, the very real possibility of sea level rise measured in meters in the course of this century. Jim Hansen of NASA, our foremost climatologist, testified in court under oath in Vermont, actually, last year in a federal case brought by the automakers in Detroit to try to stop the imposition of new mileage standards. He testified that it was now entirely plausible to imagine a five or six meter rise in sea level before this century was out. That is a civilization-threatening change. Our civilization as we know it, never mind the endless rest of creation that we're also endangering, can't absorb those kind of blows. There's not enough money in the world to move the cities, to move, that, I mean, that is, that's not something we should be contemplating, but it's something we have to contemplate. And so this period, comes with a number two. And it's probably the most important number in the world right now. The number that everyone needs to know. And that number is 350, 350 parts per million. In December, at the American Geophysical Union, Hansen gave a paper in which he said, if we are, if we are to maintain this planet in anything approaching its current condition, then the upper limit for the value of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has got to be 350 parts per million. That's tough news. Okay, you know why that's tough news? It's tough news because we're already at 385 parts per million. Okay? We're already out of whatever safe zone there is. We're out in the danger zone and we're dodging bullets and that's where we are right now. We didn't know it. We used to think that we had some more margin, we had some more room, that we had another decade or two. We don't. That's where we are now. Now, that doesn't mean that the story's over, okay? 
It's like going to the doctor, and the doctor says your cholesterol is 50 points too high. It doesn't mean that you then immediately keel over on the doctor's floor and expire. Okay? It does mean that you no longer get to eat cheese. Okay? <laughs> and that's where we are. Just as our body will cycle a certain amount of cholesterol out of our bloodstream if we change our habits, so too the Earth retains a carbon cycling system that will take some of that carbon out and pull us down below that 350 parts per million at some point if we stop adding more all the time. But, but, it's an incredibly tough number for all the reasons that you've seen about all those business as usual scenarios and indeed about all the kind of scenarios that we've talked about for the last 10 years about 60% reduction in this and doing things by 2050 and on and on and on. What the science is now telling us is that our sense of how much time we had, how much urgency was attached to this, how quickly we needed to move, what we needed to do was wrong. And that the reality in which we live is very different than that. And that we have to get going in far, far more dynamic fashion than we have so far. That the only analogy, maybe, for the kind of progress that we need and the speed with which we need to do it is not you know, the sort of steady transformation of our economies is, you know, we retire useful pieces of equipment on their normal lifespans. The only real analogy is what we did before World War II, when in the course of a year we changed the economic system of this country to stop producing consumer goods and stop produ start producing the material we needed to fight and win the war against fascism. If we're going to win the war against carbon, or even fight it to something that resembles a truce, Okay, then we're going to need that kind of level of engagement. And I think that that's the bottom line that comes through this new science that people have been hinting at in one PowerPoint after another over the course of this weekend. When people keep saying, yeah, but the news may be worse than we thought, or here's how the numbers are actually coming in, or here's how the carbon emissions level is actually above the worst projection that we've seen from the IPCC, all of that. Okay. This is what it's telling us. OK. Enough science, because that's where we've been much of this weekend. And really, enough policy, because that's where we've been the rest of this weekend. What we've got to talk about now is not science and not policy, but politics. How we might actually produce that kind of transformation get that kind of energy going that might actually allow us to take on this question on the scale with which it must be taken on as the priority in our society, in our world at this time. So far, there's been very little, all, taken, all things considered, political response to this crisis, especially in this country, very little. Congress has yet to pass any kind of law. As Brian said earlier today, that we're now considering a law in the Senate, but there's absolutely no hope that the president's going to sign it, um, um, even if it gets through. We haven't done anything for 20 years, okay? Anything that amounts to anything. And you can tell that we haven't done anything because our carbon emissions have continued to steadily rise. This isn't a question where good intentions help at all. We know whether or not we're winning by how much carbon is pouring into the atmosphere. There are reasons for that. Some of them are predictable. Strong vested interests in opposition. Look, ExxonMobil made more money than any company in the history of money last year. Okay? <laughs> they made in profit $40 billion. We could pool all of our spare change and come up somewhere short of that. Okay? We're not going to beat them in that way, and probably we're not going to beat you know, the coal interests in this state in that way because they have mismatched power, at least in those kind of economic and conventional political terms. So that's part of it. There's also, and this should not be underestimated, an enormous amount of inertia in these systems and in our own lives in terms of tackling them. 
look, this is not some situation where the only villain is the coal company or ExxonMobil or something else. We all know that we're deeply implicated in this and that it's our inability to change that provides part of the problem and, and part of the drama. And it's the biggest reason, I think, even more than the power of ExxonMobil or the coal companies or things, that we don't see more political change. Politicians are incredibly sensitive measuring devices for figuring out what people are willing to do. Okay? And at the moment, I think they ac accurately sense the limits of our willingness to engage in change of the kind that we need. And there's a third reason, okay? a good reason. I don't think it's been one of the major ones, but it's worth mentioning because at the very least it's a reason that provides cover for some of the bad ones. And that is that as we survey the world, we know that there are an awful lot of poor people out there. Okay? People who need to develop a lot more, need to have more in their lives in terms of security and comfort and just dignity. And the easiest way for them to achieve that is the same way we achieved it, which is by burning lots of cheap fossil fuel. And so there has been an unwillingness to engage maybe out of some fear that in so doing, we harm those people. Those set of considerations, and there may be more, are sliding us over the edge of a precipice, and they're sliding us over it fast. We don't have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to slowly adjust to this problem. We have a few years in order to get it right. Hansen has said that if we, by about 2012, to use the Mayan calendar, are not um, putting less carbon into the atmosphere instead of more, that we may have passed tipping points beyond which it'll become increasingly hard to ever get back to that 350 level. Okay? We may be setting in motion changes so vast in the geology and geography of the planet that they overwhelm what comes afterward. So it's a good thing that we're finally seeing the first stirrings of a real movement in this country that might begin to put some of the pressure on that we need. And we've been seeing them popping up for the last couple of years, last two or three years, maybe the first moment was Katrina, which taught us a lot of lessons about a lot of things in our society, but one of them clearly was that physical forces were beginning to get wickedly out of control. Hurricanes draw their power from the warmth of the first few meters of the sea's surface. You make the sea warmer, you develop stronger hurricanes. After Hurricane Katrina came Hurricane Gore with his excellent slideshow and awakened a lot of people to do a lot of things. Really got people to finally to kind of concentrate on this a little bit. If there was any problem with it, it was that the solutions that it proffered were small. People did them or have begun to do them, you know, installing the new light bulb, that sort of thing, but clearly not at the level that we need to materially change the trajectory of our economy or our society. Washington has obviously been shut off to any real progress on this, not just in the last eight years, really. I mean, the Clinton administration talked a pretty good game, but they didn't do a damn thing, and carbon emissions increased 10 or 12 percent during the eight years they spent in office. Now, of course, we don't even talk a good game. We pretend that it doesn't exist, and we want nothing to do with it. The one advantage of shutting off Washington from any progress has been that there's been, that energy has been kind of forced onto the state and local level, and people have done good things on those levels. And Salt Lake City is one of those things, one of those places where that's happened. One of the people I've really admired is Rocky Anderson and his work on these issues, uh, which has been noticed across the country. Um, um, it's been a good start. But, but, you can't do this work in the end on the state and local level and effect, expect it to have the kind of effect that it needs in the time that it needs. Only Washington is capable of changing the price of energy, and only Washington is capable of engaging in the next step of this, even more difficult, the international negotiations that will be needed to solve this problem, not just here, but around the world. Okay? And if that's going to happen, 
if that's going to happen, if that change from the center is going to take place, it is only going to take place if we build a movement to make it take place. Okay? A real movement, real fast. Now, look, what follows these next few stories, okay, are the confessions of a clueless amateur. I am a writer. That is what I do, okay, or what I've done. I'm not an activist. I don't really know how to do any of this stuff. But at a certain point a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I just fell into such a state of despair about it all that it seemed like we finally had to do something. Okay? I was living in Vermont. So I called up a couple of my other writer friends and said, we've got to do something. Let's, um, let's walk up to, let's go up to the federal building in Burlington, which is our main city in Vermont. And we'll sit in on the steps of the federal building and we'll get arrested and there'll be a little story in the Burlington Free Press and at least we will have done something, you know. And these, everybody, three or four people I called, they were all writers too, just, to, oh, okay, we'll, we'll do it, that sounds right. Um, um, as clueless as I was, you know. Happily, someone called up to the police in Burlington, said, what would happen if we went and did this intrepid thing? And the police said, nothing will happen. Um, um, <laughs> You're welcome to sit on the steps and we'll come visit you. Um, the clear implication was that we would need to burn down the federal building. We calculated the carbon emissions from that. And, and, and instead, a few of us just started sending out emails to everybody we knew and said, look, in a couple of weeks we're going to do this, take a little pilgrimage. Okay, come join us. And two or three weeks later, we started. Started walking. We started at um, Robert Frost's old summer writing cabin up in the Green Mountains. Because we liked that most cliched of all high school English class poems about the road not taken. It seemed apropos in this case. Okay? And so for five days we walked and we would camp in fields at night and do programs in churches in the evening. I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher. I used all my Methodist connections, you know, we were on we went. And by the time we got to Burlington, there were thousands of us marching, which in Vermont is an ungodly horde of people. Um, 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 no, it was the biggest protest about anything in, in, you know, as far back as anyone could remember. And it was interesting. This was fall before last. So we were having our congressional elections, okay? And this was a crowd plenty big enough to draw all of our candidates for political office to come meet with us, not just to meet with us. We got him to come up on stage and to sign this big piece of cardboard we had with the pledge that they would work to cut emissions 80% by 2050, which, as I say now, isn't enough. But at the time, it was the most radical plan anyone could come up with. It was way further than anything anybody in Congress was considering or anything like that. Well, what do you know? They all get up and signed, one after the another, not just the liberal Democrats, of which we have a fair number in Vermont, but everybody else too. The woman who was running for, for Congress on the GOP ticket, and who almost won, the adjutant general of our state national guard, a woman named Martha Rainville, had said two months before, when she was declaring for office, that she was not sure that climate change was real, and that more research needed to be done. You know, the last refuge of all um, um, sort of intellectual dishonesty on this issue, but that's what she'd said, and it was sort of in line with what a lot of her peers were doing and things. You know what? It turned out that the more research that needed to be done was not about physics or chemistry. It was about how many people were going to walk across Vermont, okay? And when a thousand people did, that was the threshold at which she got up and signed this thing. And not only that, she ran Every, the rest of the campaign, all her commercials showed her signing. She photoshopped out the names of all the other candidates, but it was, it was, for me and for the people who I was working with who were mostly college kids, it was really important to see that, okay? Because it made us, we'd grown, I think, unhealthily cynical about our political system, okay? Too ready to dismiss it as completely impossible and unwieldy and nothing could happen. The only bummer in this thing was to open the newspaper the next morning and read a story 
that said that these thousand people that had gathered for this thing might have been the largest demonstration about climate change that had yet taken place in this country. Okay? Anyway. Which suddenly made me understand why we were making so little progress on any of this. And it made us decide to see whether or not, I'm going to start passing something around here, if you guys don't mind. Um, um, because I want you, I want to, for those of you who are going to talk about our next step in all of this in a little while, but I want to get your names, those of you who want to work on this kind of activist campaign here and around the world, it would be really useful for us to, to capture your uh, information at this point so we can be in touch. So I'm going to start passing this around. We decided to see if this was just funky old Vermont where we could do this, or if this was something that might work elsewhere. And when I say we, I mean me and six then college students at Middlebury College where I have a kind of loose association. And we on January 10th of last year opened a website, stepitup07.org. We didn't have any money and we didn't have any organization, we didn't have any lists or anything like that. So we had we should have had, anyway, sort of low expectations of what we could do. What we asked people to do was organize demonstrations in their communities three months or so hence, in mid-April, with this same demand for 80 percent by 2050 reductions. We were hoping, against hope, that we might organize a hundred of these around the country, okay? And that would have been a hundred more than there had been, and we would have been considered ourselves done our work well. Instead, and very little thanks to us, the thing just took off. Okay? Three months later, when we did this, there were 1,400 demonstrations on that one Saturday in all 50 states. One of the best ones here in Salt Lake that Rocky and many others helped organize. Okay? And thank you very much for those of you who did it. Thank you so much for all you who, who worked on that. It was amazing. It was amazing to um, it was amazing to sit that night by the computer. We'd gathered as many dignitaries as we could in Washington, okay? Because we wanted them to see these sort of results coming in from all over the country. Okay? We rented out a hall in Washington at the Smithsonian. And, we were getting ready to show all these pictures and stuff, but the seven of us who'd organized this couldn't tear ourselves away from the computer because it was just too beautiful to watch these pictures. Everybody was uploading pictures from all across America. We'd ask people to try to think of kind of iconic places and things that would really get this message across to their neighbors. Okay? And it was so gorgeous to watch them come in. So people in Key West, Florida, okay? they've got in the continental US the only coral reefs that we've got in this country, okay? Coral reefs, not an ecosystem that can survive much more global warming at all, okay? We're already losing immense swaths of them every year to bleaching. So these guys didn't do a terrestrial demonstration. They got on scuba deer, lots of them, and went underwater and held up these big signs, step it up, Congress, cut car, and a big fish swimming around in the middle of it. The video is so beautiful from any sort of inner species, you know, collaboration on <laughs> this stuff. And then a little further up, will someone from that side get set? Here's a pen. And maybe someone over here can get these passing around. And then also, Elizabeth, here's just a, you can pass out a few of these cards to people who might like them, and maybe over here as well. Um, um, a little further up the coast in Jacksonville. Now, I've never been to Jacksonville, but my theory is that it's somewhat different from Vermont, okay? And, and the place that they chose for their demonstration was the parking lot of the Jacksonville Jaguars NFL football stadium, okay? Because apparently that's really where sort of community is there. On Sundays in the fall, they have huge tailgates. Everybody comes and it's a big deal. So this was the spring. They just kind of took it over and they got a crane and they hoisted a yacht 20 feet up in the air, and they said, look, 
when Greenland slides into the ocean, that's where the ocean will be. Okay. And you could just hear from a thousand miles away. You could hear people saying, okay, I get it now. You know, I understand. Lower Manhattan, thousands of people in blue shirts holding hands, sea of people, they called it, to show where the new tide line would be once the ocean had risen a little bit on the most expensive real estate in the world. Out in the west, there were people who did these elaborate two and three day ascents of glaciated peaks and then skied down them in formation, kind of webcasting as they went, you know, saying, look, these glaciated peaks aren't going to be glaciated very much longer, you know. In fact, much of the snowpack on which we depend will be gone before much longer, unless we're able to do something on and on and on all across the country. It was incredibly beautiful, that kind of creativity that people were able to bring to bear. And and it had a real effect, okay? Just like when we did it in Vermont, it had a real effect. That 80% by 2050 number, by the time within a few days of those demonstrations being finished, all of the Democratic presidential candidates had signed on to that goal, which as I say, six months before was very fringe and pretty radical, and none of them would have touched it with a 10-foot pole. Brian showed you that stuff about the bill finally moving through the Senate, uh, 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 McCain-Warner bill that's now up, up for debate and it talks about 70% reductions by 2050. Absent the kind of burst of activism represented by people in this room, that bill, which is insufficient now, would have been completely insufficient. If they'd introduced it a year before, it would have been for 20 or 30 or 40% by 2050. It would have been a complete joke, which it no longer is. It's now at least moving in the right direction. That kind of movement and much more, much more, is what it's going to take. Someone asked the question earlier uh, 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 in the last panel, said, do we need to go out in the streets or something? And Well, yes. The answer is yes. That's precisely where we need to go, and we need to do it fast and, and dramatically. Politely, that's fine. Peacefully, that's good. But visibly, publicly, noisily, angrily. Because if we don't, there's no chance of waking up the sleeping political system that needs to change. I am reminded sometimes of the very first kind of activist stuff about global warming that I ever did, which was seven or eight years ago, and it was the first little demonstration really in the whole country, first certainly the first time that people got arrested. And I only went down to Washington, you know, I'm a writer, I don't, I don't like to do this kind of thing at some level, okay? I only went down to Washington because this friend of mine who I really admire, a woman some of you may have heard of, a woman named Granny D. Um, this woman who at the age of 90 had walked all the way across America, okay? And she's got the emphysema. She was walking like five miles a day. I mean, it took a long time, all the way across America, okay, to demand campaign finance reform and a sort of getting our, well, she said, we're going to do this demonstration about campaign finance reform and global warming, and please come. So I went to, what was I going to say? She's 90 years old. I'm well trained by my parents. And I, down I went. And we were arrested in the rotunda of the Capitol for holding a banner that said, stop campaign contributions from global warmers, stop global warming. Okay, and they led us away. It was, it was sort of funny because they handcuffed the two of us together and she's like four foot six or something. So, you know, <laughs> sort of being led out by like this. But she looked up at me at, at one point, she said, you know, she said, I'm 93. I've never been arrested. I should have started long ago, she said. <laughs> um, I look out here and see one or two heads flecked with gray like mine, you know. It's worth remembering that it's never too late to start in this kind of uh, endeavor. And it's precisely, I don't know if we need to get arrested or not, but I do know that we need to take it way more seriously than we've taken it to date. Hence this stuff that's going around now. Because what we're trying to do, the same group of kids and I, and this is the first announcement of any kind of it today. Um, um, what we're going to try to do now is figure out a way to take the same kind of grassroots climate activism around the world, okay? 
and to take this number, this arcane number, 350, and stick it in every brain on the planet, if we can, tattoo it into every mind. And we don't know quite how we're going to do this, which is one of the reasons that I'm passing around those cards and that sign-up sheet. We've just set up a website, which I want you to go to, because we need ideas about how to make this happen in all kinds of places, all around the world. What kind of demonstrations, what kind of art, what kind of music, what kind of video, what kind of everything we can do to take that number and stick it deep in people's consciousness. Because you know, way even more important than all the kind of technological changes and policy frameworks and all of that that we have, it's getting some kind of real goal out there that's most important of all. Because as we saw with that 80% by 2050 thing, the mere existence of numbers like that exerts a kind of magnetic pull on the political environment. Okay? People begin to, there's no other number out there. There's you know, no one saying we need 700 parts per million and that, you know. We can, if we can get that number deep into people's imaginations in every part of this planet, then the international negotiations that are going on over the next two or three years will be different than they would otherwise be, and much tougher, and much more radical, and take us much further, and open up the kind of room to allow Utah state officials or energy planners in this country or anybody else to not do incremental, slow, business as usual kind of change, but to do transformative kind of change, World War II kind of change, dramatic kind of change that has some hope of getting us where we need to be. Now, I cannot promise you that it'll be enough or that it'll work, okay? I don't know. I gotta say, the, the only the only flaw in that introduction of me was that the name of the book that I wrote many years ago about this topic wasn't actually The Control of Nature, which would have been a good title. It was, it was The End of Nature. Okay? I'm not the most glib optimist that ever lived about this stuff. I think it's entirely possible that we're going to lose. Okay? In fact, from everything you've seen in the last couple of days, if you were forced to bet you'd be wise to take the under, as we say, you know? Um, um, um. And yet, I am completely willing to work with every bit of strength and guile and whatever that I possess over the next few years to try to make that different, to try to see what we can do. We need a movement at least as passionate, at least as morally urgent, at least as committed, at least as willing to sacrifice as the civil rights movement was a generation ago. At least that. Probably much deeper. Because the change that we're asking for is not only change here. You know, we're going to have to get our own act together, which is going to be very hard. And then we're going to have to play a big role in helping the rest of the world too. Because the Chinese and the Indians are not going to abandon the idea of development for their people simply because they're scared about global warming, okay? If they're going to not burn all the coal that they possess, and they possess lots of it, if they're not going to burn all that coal, they're only going to do it if we take some small part of the wealth that we have gathered up in a hundred years of burning fossil fuels and in the form of technology mostly transfer it to them so that they have some chance of developing without burning that coal. And that's going to require a new level of generosity on our part that at the moment our political system cannot produce. The idea of trying to pass a kind of carbon Marshall plan in this society at the moment is ludicrous. And so we've got to change that. We've got to make it clear what the stakes are, both the moral stakes and the practical ones, if we're going to have any hope of change on the scale that's required. So I can't promise that it's going to work out all right. All I can tell you 
All I can promise is that this is the question for our moment on this planet. Okay? This, and, and, and y'all are in the avant-garde on the cutting edge of having to deal with that. And that's, in a sense, a great burden. Y'all know what's going on. Y'all understand the stakes. And hence, the moral obligation to do something serious about it falls on you. Okay? And I, I don't say that in the slightest bit lightly, because it is a heavy burden trying to build that kind of movement, trying to make those things happen, will be difficult. But it'll also be great fun. The kind of communities that build when people take action together are the prototypes of the kind of communities we need to build to climb out of the materialist and individualist mess into which our society has fallen. And it'll also be our way, one way, of being able to say thank you for the world onto which we were born, this incredibly beautiful and mysterious world that we get to inhabit, this place that writers like Stegner or Terry Tempest Williams or Ed Abbey described in all its glory and wonder and power. This is our chance to try to somehow bear meaningful witness to the honor of living on that kind of planet. And it would be a terrible thing. It would be a terrible thing to, at the end of one's life, say that the planet that we inhabited was much, much impoverished from the one that we'd been born onto, and that we hadn't done all that we could to keep that from happening. I wish I had something more wonderfully uplifting and happy and optimistic to leave you with. It's hard. The people who did the Civil Rights Movement needed to be braver, you know, because they faced great risks. And no one's going to shoot you for standing up about climate change. But they had the great luxury, one great luxury, of knowing that eventually they would win. Martin Luther King always said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. He had no doubt. None. And if you listen to his speech the night before he died, you convicted of this. He had no doubt what the outcome would be. We don't have that luxury. The outcome very much hangs in the balance. And it hangs in the balance in the next few years. And it's a real pleasure to be in a room full of people who are going to do something about that. Thank you very much. So I have not seen No Country for Old Men yet. Uh, but I think you know one bottom line is that when things get tough, people sometimes get mean. And uh, I think one uh, aspect of what you're saying is maybe we start building some of these communities and start building uh, awareness so that when things do get tough and when hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people start being displaced from peri-equatorial zones, heading north or south, that we have some kind of social infrastructure to deal with that. Can you well, comment on that? Yeah. You know, my intellectual work in recent years, as opposed to the sort of activist work that I've been describing, has largely been about local community and local economy. I wrote a book that came out last year called Deep Economy um, that really attempted to, to get at these questions, because I think two things about local economies. One, I think they're what we need to do. One of the ways in which we need to reduce some of the pressure, um, um, environmental pressure. I mean, as Randy said earlier today, the world that we inhabit, the architecture of that world is, is a um, artifact of $10 oil, OK? And it's built to consume oil at, and, and coal in enormous quantities. And if we can localize to some degree the economies that we've spent the last hundred years globalizing, if we can spend the next decade reeling in some of those supply lines, if we can stop making every bite of food we eat travel 1,500 miles before it reaches our lips, on and on and on, then we'll achieve some significant energy savings. 
probably more important in the process of doing that, we'll build the kind of communities that will survive whatever is coming that we're not able to head off completely. You know, when people talk about farmers markets, say, which are now the fastest growing part of the food economy in this country, the thing that they tend to focus on is the environmental benefits, which is good. The real benefit of a farmer's market is this. A pair of sociologists followed shoppers last year, first around a supermarket, then around a farmer's market. People at a farmer's market had 10 times more conversations okay, than people at the supermarket. They were engaged in, without really knowing it, just the kind of basic human tasks of building working societies. And we spent the last 50 years engaged in the opposite task, building highly individualistic societies that do not work well as communities because we've been able to because of cheap oil. Cheap oil made us rich. Cheap oil destroying the atmosphere. And cheap oil made us, and cheap coal made us the first people on earth who have no practical need of our neighbors. Okay? And that's been a um, recipe for disintegration of communities. It's been a recipe for unhappiness among Americans who have become, by all statistical measures, significantly less content with their lives over the last 50 years, even as our standard of living has trebled. We need much stronger communities for all kinds of reasons. And one of them is to be resilient and durable enough to handle whatever's coming that we're not able to head off. We've got to do all this work at the national, international level. And we've also got the deeply satisfying work of building our own strong local communities, too. And we can't neglect either part of this, unfortunately. Thank you so much for being here and speaking to us. I heard you speak last year in Boulder um, when your book had just come out, Deep Economy. And one of the, um, I, this is an alternative energy conference, However, I feel that one of the issues that we have to address is an alternative way of living, which is maybe a return to how we did live, which uh, local um, farmers markets certainly um, address. But it's the idea of consumerism. And I was wondering if you could address um, the um, thesis of your book, Deep Economy, of um, how we have been living an economic lifestyle that is unlimited and how we have to limit our, um, our economy and not think that we have unlimited growth. One of the, one of the difficulties, of, and we've seen it in chart after chart for the last couple of days, one of the difficulties of coming to grips with climate change is that all of our calculations have to keep taking into account the idea that we're going to double the size of the economy in the next 50 years. And you know, hence it doubles the burden of having anything to do about it. All we've asked of our economies for the last 50 or 100 years, the only real question, policy question, that we've asked of them are, you know, can we make it larger? Okay? Economic growth has become the ide fix of our uh, you know, existence, and around the world, much the same. And I think that that's probably going to change a little bit. I think we're going to ask, and happily we'll have economists to help us answer more complicated and interesting questions about our economy. Not only can we make it bigger, but much more importantly, can we make it last? You know, can we figure out some way to make it durable? And, and I mean, just look at the wreckage, the economic wreckage strewn around us at the moment as, you know, a decade of building crappy mansions, you know, on the furthest edge of suburbia threatens to kind of tank large sections of, of our economy, you know. Uh, can we make it durable? Can we make it last? And can it produce much more in the way of human satisfaction? All that data about increasing human unhappiness seems deeply tied, to the degree we can tell, to a lack of feeling, a strong feeling of a loss of community and a lack of connection among other people. You know, what has the American economy been about for the last 50 years? The basic driving force has been building bigger houses farther apart from each other. That's where we've spent most of our wealth for the last 50 years, okay? That's had obvious you know, energy implications because now you've got 3,500 square feet to heat and cool and light and you have to drive everywhere you go because you're so far away from anyone. But it's also had deep social implications. The average American has half as many close friends as they did 50 years ago. I guess what I'm trying to say, and I think what you're trying to say, is that our assumption 
that we've somehow, that the economy that we've built and the society that we've got is the best of all possible things and that we should do whatever it takes to try to maintain it in just its current form is not a luxury that we have and not one that we should want to have. We should be thinking much more creatively about what the possibilities are. And as we do, we'll begin to find real, here's a statistic to bear in mind, okay? If I had a PowerPoint, I would put it up. Um, the average Western European, people here been to Western Europe in recent years, to Italy or France or something, you will testify to other people that people in those countries are living relatively decent lives that one could imagine living, you know, and whatever, okay? The average Western European uses half as much energy as the average American. Half. Half is a big number. Half is a bigger number than we get from biomass, than we get from ethanol, than we get from nuclear, than we get from thermal solar, than we get from anything we have discussed in the last day and a half. Half is a big number. Basically, they've gotten it from having a slightly different arrangement of their society, a slightly different emphasis on community as opposed to the individual. You know, they've built good cities that drew people in instead of spinning them out. They built good mass transit. And then having built it, they actually took it. You know, people went five minutes out of their way to travel with their neighbors instead of insisting on going where they needed to go at just the second that they wanted to go there. And among other things, one, one very practical question for the next period is whether or not we can convince the Chinese and the Indians to live like people in Copenhagen and not like us. You know, I mean, if there's a good use for jet fuel in this world, it's flying lots and lots of Chinese and Indian officials to Copenhagen and Brussels and all places. Say, look, this is how you do it. You know, not Houston. Houston is not what you want to do. <laughs> this is what you want to do, and that would uh, that would be a help. You know, back there. Uh, by mere coincidence, uh, there are some groups here in Salt Lake City who are trying to. Uh, make a pro more broader uh, movement by combining environmental issues with uh, social justice issues, healthcare, and anti-war issues. We are organizing a, um, a rally with speeches and, and a, a little walk on April 5th, which is the day after uh, the April 4 is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And we have invited Rocky as our keynote speaker. And I need, we need the, um, the help of all of you here in the audience because we need a, a big turnout for this. And I want also to ask you, Bill, uh, publicly how we can link up this, uh, this action with the actions which you are doing around the number 350. Which I was just about wonderful. to say, you need a big banner at the back that says 350, and if you can get, you know, 350 school kids out front and dressed in green t-shirt, or if you can have 350 people come on bicycles, or if you can figure out some other ways to dramatize that number, that's just what we need, and that's just the kind, that, that combination of, deep combination of issues is extremely important. The only thing I would caution, the only thing I, I keep reminding myself, because my goal is always to work on all kinds of different things, is that we've got to do it in such a way that we actually make this big change on a national and international level in the next few years, that we build up enough pressure on that level to make things happen. So we need enough of a focus around something like this number 350 to really force that kind of action. And I think it's a terrific plan, and I think that the, um, the commemoration of Dr. King's assassination should be one of those real moments at which we um, take pause as a society. Um, you know, that was one of, the, um, one of the sad turning points in this country, and it's, it's um, it's sobering to reflect on how differently our society might have turned out if Dr. King hadn't been shot and if Bobby Kennedy hadn't been shot and if a lot of other things hadn't happened. 
but they were, and so we have to take up that cause. And it doesn't do any good, though I've been following the presidential election with great avidity, it doesn't do any good to wait for the next president to come and save this problem, because that's not going to happen. It's only going to happen if that president, whoever it is, feels enormous pressure to act and feels enormous support for taking that kind of action that's going to be, at some level, difficult and unpopular and hard to take. So that's the kind of movement we need to build. I wanted to ask a question regarding the word that has never spoken during these, this day and a half, and that's population. As a child of the 60s and Paul Ehrlich, who influenced me tremendously, I don't understand how we can sit here and talk about alternative energy and 350 and not address the politically unacceptable word population as part of the solution. It's a very good question, and I sense that we're coming to an end, so it allows me to end on a, um, in a sense, on a very positive note, okay? Of the various environmental crises that we face, the one that you can make the strongest argument that we've actually done something about in the last 30 years is population, okay? Um, thanks to Paul Ehrlich and people like him and then all sorts of other people, first in this country, but then very quickly in the developing world itself, people took up this cause. And they figured out, and again, this was, you know, our, our initial efforts were all about supplying contraceptives and things which were important, but it turned out that the real method was about sort of change in consciousness. The real contraceptive turned out to be education, and education for women in particular, and allowing people some sense of empowerment over their own lives. And when that happened, you know, the statistical result was quite remarkable. 30 years ago, the average woman on this planet had six children. That number is well under three and falling pretty fast now still around the world. The demographers say human population will not double again, won't even come close. We're six billion now, we're gonna top out all things being equal someplace around nine billion in mid-century. Now that's a good news, bad news thing because the planet has a hard time with six billion and nine billion won't be any easier. Um, on the other hand, most of that increase is built into the age structure of the population. It's just the, the number of people coming into their childbearing years is large now. And it's going to be pretty hard to stop it too much short of that. Um, and the other, at least for global warming, piece of somewhat good news, I guess, is that most of that population increase, 90% of it, is concentrated in places that use so little energy that in terms of global warming, they won't... I mean, the average Tanzanian family, the average American family uses more energy between the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve and dinner on January 2nd than the average Tanzanian family uses in the course of a year. So for worrying about global warming, the number of Tanzanians is not an important factor. Okay? The number of Americans may be an important factor. And the thought of the Census Bureau says that our 300 million Americans now will go to 500 million by mid-century, okay? That's a lot of Americans, you know, living the way that Americans live. We're the only industrialized nation that's growing like that. Um, and, and that's why I wrote a book some years ago uh, called Maybe One that said that people might want to think about, in this society, having one child, um, which is what I've done. And much of the book was devoted to the quite pleasurable task of debunking the, uh, the long-standing myths in our society about the um, craziness of only children, um, which turns out to be completely made up. Um, um, if, you know, but it's important because the single biggest reason that Americans give for having a second child is so that their first child won't be an only child. Okay? <laughs> if that's your reason, don't do it. There's other reasons to have less kids, but that's not a good one. And, you know, if as many Americans had one, if, if one-child families were as common as two-child families in our society, okay, then we could have historically high levels of immigration and our population would still plateau and then go down instead of climbing to that 500 million level. So something at least, it's a very good question to think about, but it really is an example of how human beings seized with the understanding of a problem, 
went to work on it, and that much of that work was sort of unconscious, the way much of the work of markets and things around energy will be unconscious once we put into place this price on carbon that allows us to begin the sort of vigorous work on things once we do this political work. It's that first big boost that in the next few years we have to give on this issue, of this issue of climate. We've got to get this enormous boulder unstuck and rolling. And exactly what direction it rolls down the hill, exactly what combination of policies it's, we're going to take, whether exactly whether we're going to, what mix of hydrogen and solar we're going to use, is way less important than merely getting the damn thing moving finally, getting us off this growth curve and getting us onto this other curve. And we can do it, but we can only do it politically. We can only do it by summoning our kind of common resolve to make change at the level where it matters. And if we don't, then all the rest of this is merely talk. Um, and none of us want it to be. We need that kind of action. Thank you all.